Good evening, folks, and thanks for joining us for tonight's Women in Defence and Security Network careers panel. This has uh, been the first careers panel or careers event for WDSN this year, thanks to, unfortunately, the pandemic. Um, but we're really glad that we can bring you this panel tonight. Um, I'm Kelly Smith. I'm the events and comms manager here at ASPE and the moderator for tonight's event. So um, first, I'd like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal people, the traditional custodians of land, which I host the webinar on here tonight. Um, ASPE's Women in Defence and Security Network is a forum that ASPE established a while ago to support the career development of women in this community and establish a network within it. So we're delighted to bring you this panel and discuss professional pathways, especially in a time as uh, uncertain as now, um, and to bring you a discussion with four incredible women who one will hopefully be joining us shortly, but um, some technical difficulties. Um, but so joining us tonight, we have Major General Cheryl Pierce, um, all the way from Cyprus, Force Commander United Nations um, in Cyprus. Um, we have Leanne Close, who's ASPE's head of CT, um, the counterterrorism program here. Uh, Dr. Huang Li Thu, who's um, the senior analyst here at ASPE with the Defense and Strategy Network, uh, sorry, program. And Julianne um, will be joining us very shortly. Um, she's the ambassador for, and the first assistant secretary um, for gender equality at DFAT. So we hope you can join us shortly. Um, but it's such a diverse range of career experience that we have here tonight. So I'm eager to sort of jump right in. Um, I'm gonna ask each of our speakers to introduce themselves and tell us a bit about their career paths and what drew them to this field. You know, national security, it's so broad. Um, but for those watching, if you haven't um, experienced an ASPE webinar before, oh, hi, Julianne, how are you going? Thanks for joining us. Very well, thank you. <laughs> um, so I was just going through our introductions. Um, so if anyone hasn't used the platform before, you'll notice a questions tab. Um, and please, we, we really wanna hear your questions and answer anything you'd like to hear from the panel tonight. So throw them in there whenever you think of them. Um, and so turning to the panel, I might uh, start with Leanne. Um, you recently spoke to us for the WDSN um, profiles that we run and I was struck with how incredibly interesting your career has been to date and probably will continue to be. So can you tell us a little bit about your career um, and how you found your way here to ASPE with us? Sure. Thanks, Kelly. So um, I've been at ASPE only since April and I was a very fortunate person to be picked up by ASPE in the middle of COVID. So it's been a really interesting transition coming in working remotely. Uh, before that, I had over 33 years working in the Australian Federal Police. I was only 19 when I joined the AFP, so I was really young. Uh, and I joined almost straight out of school. I had about 12 months in the um, working for the Reserve Bank of Australia before I decided and was successful in joining the organisation. Uh, so in terms of career, I was um, absolutely blessed in terms of the diversity of the career I experienced, even though it was one organisation for such a long period of time. Um, I had the opportunity to work across the whole of the organisation uh, and also vertically in, in various leadership roles. So I worked in investigations, I worked in ACT community policing, I worked in the training college, which thoroughly enjoyed. Uh, I moved into leadership roles along the way and moved up through the, the chain of command in the AFP at various points. And the thing that kept driving me to do that was just that ability to shape and influence at various levels in the organisation, which I really enjoyed. I enjoyed working with people, mentoring and guiding them and helping with them with their careers but also shaping the organisation and the way that we were leading, the, what, the um, outcomes we were delivering for the organisation as well. Uh, so that's probably a snapshot of what I did um, working across so many different diverse areas. And we've got a lot of speakers. I'll probably hand over there. Thanks, Kel. Thanks so much. Um, I'll, I'll go to um, Cheryl. Um, thank you so much for joining us all the way from Cyprus. Um, so uh, you're obviously in the army um, and your experience from your bio, it sounds incredible. Could you run us through, um, you know, a bit about your career and a bit about your position that you're in now? Kelly, look, thank you. Um, look, it's great to be able to join from Cyprus and we're at 10.30 in the morning, so, um, and it's the middle of summer, so wonderful it is. 
um, a great environment here to be and probably one of the better ones around globally at the moment. But um, bio has been put up, so I won't sort of talk uh, too much about that. But a lot of my bio is focused on the latter part of my career, but it's really my formative years that made me uh, who I am. And uh, I came a bit like Leanne. I joined very young. I was 18 when I joined. I come from country South Australia. Um, and it was a great opportunity. I knew I wanted to serve something that was greater than myself. And uh, I wanted to get out of my small town and to be part of, of something greater. Uh, it was a really interesting time. This was um, mid 80s. And so females in um, in in the military had only really just opening up. We had um, a lot of the legislative frameworks hadn't um, been set yet. I was involved in the first year of integrated training uh, with males and females together. And for that, it was um, it was really interesting. I didn't know any different. It was it was hard. It was culturally hard, behaviourally hard. The physicality was hard. Um, but I was just determined to, uh, you know, give it my best shot at that time to, to, I didn't want to fail. If, if I was honest, I went through a lot of my earlier years about this fear of failure. And so it really drove me to be the best I could be in, in all of my jobs. And um, sometimes when, you know, and I'll say this to those that are listening, sometimes when it's overwhelming on the bigger picture, how do I get through this training or how to get through jobs is to pull back pull back from a year to a month to a week to a day to a time that you can grab and say, I can control this. And it might be the next lesson or the next day or, and it was, it was, um, but I was really proud of what I achieved and, and getting through that. And look, I've been blessed and had some great opportunities in leadership roles in my first decade. And I'll really focus on the first decade. I was in military police units. I had training jobs, training recruits at Kapuka, which was really rewarding I also also served on an operational brigade headquarters, and that's when these first opened up. So, you know, I was I was very fortunate. I had equal pay when I joined um, integrated training, and then operational units opened up for women in '92. But I will say, besides having all these wonderful opportunities, and and hindsight is great looking back, is it's about what I didn't have. And one thing I would always empower our you know, our next generation coming through is about finding your voice and owning a voice. I didn't have that. We were less than 5%. I was so adamant about doing the best I could, being part of a team. I just wanted to fit in. And for that is that I, I held my voice. I wish I now had, had said more because um, you didn't want to be singled out because you were female. So it was all about being part of a bigger organisation, although I was a leader, but it was still about fitting in. Um, the, when I looked at role models, and I'll do that up front, I wish I had what we've got now with webinars and with wonderful um, senior females around and, and at middle management and at senior management, but very much what, uh, that alpha male role model. And uh, that was what was deemed to be success. And for me, that's where I went to. We didn't have senior females. And I then uh, gravitated towards, how can I be this, oh, this alpha male? And uh, I'm, I tried to get there. I didn't. And I'm really thankful now for my differences and really embrace those differences. And it was probably wasn't until I got to unit command of the 1st Military Police um, Battalion I'm not sure if uh, Cheryl's frozen from us, but unfortunately um, frozen here. Um, I might, if unless Cheryl comes back, um, throw to um, Julianne. Thank you um, for joining us. Um, I, I mentioned earlier uh, your current role at DFAT um, is the first assistant secretary, um, a, you know, for gender equality and the gender equality ambassador. So. Um, I'm just asking everyone if they could introduce themselves a little bit about their career and talk a little bit about their current role. Um, so I'll, I'll waste no time in handing over. Thanks. Thanks, Kelly. Um, and thanks for the opportunity today to, to describe a little bit about what it is that I have been doing with my career. Um, yes, I joined the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade in 1996, actually, uh, as a graduate trainee straight out of uh, university. Um, you could say my pathway to... Uh, not exactly uh, typical, 
um, I hadn't studied at that stage international relations and I certainly hadn't done international law. Um, I was living in far north Queensland. I was from an Indigenous background and even going to university at that stage was an accomplishment uh, in, in my family. So that was kind of rare enough in itself. But during my honours year, I guess I started thinking about, you know, what it was I wanted to do with myself. And uh, yes, it was the early 1990s. It was a really exciting time in Australian foreign policy. You know, we were at the very early stages of kind of establishing international and regional architecture. You know, we just uh, established the WTO. Uh, we had just uh, become members of APEC, of course. And, and uh, yeah, it was really about a time when we were trying to kind of center our foreign and trade policy in our own region. Um, and so I joined in, in 1996 and, of course, the next year, 1997, uh, uh, Foreign Affairs and Trade put out its first ever foreign policy white paper, which really kind of cemented uh, those issues. Um, I then had my first posting uh, to the region uh, in 1999 to India. Again, it was a really fascinating time to go, of course. 1998, both Pakistan and India had just conducted nuclear tests. Um, and so my time between 1999 and, and uh, 2000, early 2002 were really about forging a new type of relationship uh, with India. And during that time, in fact, we had a visit by uh, Prime Minister Howard and it was the first time we'd had an Australian Prime Minister visit India, I think since about uh, 1989. So really quite a significant uh, moment in, in the bilateral relationship with India. Um, after that, I returned to uh, trade issues, which were always a bit of a passion for me, having you know had a commerce background. Um, so economic security issues uh, sort of loomed large. Uh, I had a posting to Geneva at the World Trade Organization and, you know, subsequently I've done uh, negotiations on, on very large regional FTAs, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, of course, which is an FTA which involves um, our ASEAN partners, but of course China and India and uh, Korea and New Zealand and ourselves. Uh, again, it's all about kind of the thickening of our, our economic relationships, uh, you know, with countries in our region. So that was really exciting work to be involved in as well. Uh, I then, of course, went off to be our ambassador in Spain, where there were a whole range of other interesting, uh, you know, opportunities and challenges. We have um, really, uh, you know, quite significant relationships with Spain in the defence field, actually. Um, Navantia, one of the big uh, shipbuilding companies, in, uh, in, uh, in Spain is actually made, of course, our air warfare destroyers. Um, I saw the launch of two uh, auxiliary oil replenishment vessels while I was in, in Spain. And then, yes, this year on International Women's Day, uh, the uh, minister was kind enough to appoint me as uh, ambassador for gender equality here in Australia. So uh, it's been really interesting. Um, of course, we've had uh, ambassadors for women and girls or gender equality uh, since uh, 2011. And we we're still only, you know, amongst a, a few countries who have such a position, but it really is about advocacy internationally on gender equality, which is of course a very important Australian value. Um, uh, it was interesting, people were saying, well, what, what will happen, you know, uh, to your position now? Because a lot of it has involved a lot of travel in the region to, to advocate on gender equality. But I think what what we have found, of course, with COVID and its and its and its impacts is, if you look at the impacts of COVID, you know uh, there has been a differentiated impact between uh, women and men. We know that there's a disproportionate impact on women in terms of things like spikes in domestic violence. Uh, you know, women, of course, on the front line of the healthcare response. Seventy percent of our healthcare workers globally are, in fact, women. Um, we've seen high, you know, rising unemployment in sectors which have traditionally employed women. Um, so, you know, all of this is, is really something that I think has been sort of brought to the fore. The minister's been heavily engaged. Uh, uh, she had a Pacific Women's Leaders meeting. You know, we've had several female foreign ministers meeting and I've been supporting her in that work. So it's actually been a very exciting time uh, to, to kind of uh, join in this particular role. But, yeah, I think I might leave it there. Thanks. Thanks. That's really um, interesting and a really important issue, especially during COVID. So I definitely want to come back and talk a bit more about that. I might throw um, to Huang. Um, thanks for waiting patiently. Um, 
look, I see you publish something at least once a week. You're very prolific. Um, I know uh, you are an expertise across so many areas. Can you talk us through a little bit about your career, about your expertise? And, and I'd love to know how you keep up to date on everything that's happening in that sphere, because it seems very impossible. Um, yeah, it is. It is, uh, you know, mission impossible. Sometimes I talk and uh, to myself, and I think it's it's long hours. Uh, let's be honest. It's working across different time zones because I work mostly on issues in Asia, but also things related to US. So it's never a nine to five. It's never fixed times. But it's it's a dedication. I think it's it's passion. I don't see it as a job. I don't even see it as a career. It's really my lifestyle. Um, my life. Basically, and I do have other hobbies, but uh, increasingly less time for that. But it, it really gives me pleasure. I know nobody has to uh, push me to do things. I, it's just really self-driven. It's always been um, my true passion. So um, I think uh, it was interesting how I started because really um, how I started interest in the international relations and diplomacy and politics uh, because I uh, have very different career path than, than my very established co-panelist. I'm fairly new to Australia. I was born in Vietnam in post-war reality. It was very desperate a time uh, where Vietnam was isolated diplomatically and was very poor. Um, then as a very young child, I had a, a chance to be in Europe, in uh, Central Europe, in Poland uh, and, and Germany just weeks before the Berlin War fall. So, you know, things like that, when you, know, you experience your life, um, your family history, when you know that one day there is country, another day there isn't a country. One day there's this flag um, and this, these institutions, and next day there are no flags, no even money. So it's all like politics at high level that decide the lives of our individuals. Uh, and then I was always drawn to learning uh, history and politics. I wasn't going to, to, to study that. I was wanted to be an artisan or a lawyer. My parents wanted me to be a lawyer, but, uh, but I ended up, you know, following my interest and and uh, I did try more regular uh, secure jobs and the jobs that have more clarity in terms of career path but um, uh, you know uh, I it just ended it uh, following my passion and really working in international uh, space. I've lived, you know, as, as I said from uh, Southeast Asia from third world to, to second world and uh, the first word, I don't know how you call it anymore, but um, I've lived across Southeast Asia, I lived in Singapore, Taiwan before um, arriving here uh, in Australia. So it is not a, a very straightforward career. It is a lot of uncertainty, let's be honest. Uh, there's no uh, guaranteed progression and, you know, no one um, uh, has done it before. So I'm, I'm sort of um, doing it myself, inventing myself as I go. But uh, yeah, because of that, I might be less um, terrified by this uh, COVID uncertainty, but you know, not not to not to be too uh, overly confident. But uh, it seems to me that I'm um, used to that uncertainty, and and that's how we will unfortunately operate. Uh, even a, a set academic career is no longer guaranteed with with the current um, with the current circumstances. So uh, I would just say um, to anyone um, who has asked questions, I've seen some of them. Just to follow really what you want to do, and um, and so it's not easy. It's not always a bed of roses, and often it is not. But at least you have that satisfaction. And for me, uh, the biggest satisfaction is in your know, life, lifelong learning and and just the inte intellectual. Reward I get from from being in this field and doing, and you know, meeting the people like yourself. But working in this sphere of uh, it's uh, it's very rewarding, more than uh, monetary reward or uh, career stability. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, I find that point about uh, everyone's going to be dealing with this uncertainty now uh, quite striking. So I think we're going to have some questions on that. Um, I might uh, just go to, I have a few questions for each of you um, before I throw to the audience, um, but um, I'm, I might throw the first question to Leanne. Um, looking at how to set up a career, if you can sort of cast your mind back sort of to your early to mid career, um, how do you build the foundations for a career? How do you know to make that you're making the right decision at the right time for you? How do you find in, I mean, Defense and security is such a vast network and you can't know 
everything that exists. So how do you find that position where your skills and your interests intersect and, uh, yeah, choose the right step going forward? And especially in these uncertain times, how do you approach making those decisions? So, Kelly, when I um, first joined the AFP, I honestly did not think I would stay there that long. I thought I'd probably be there about, um, you know, five years or so. I have a family at that point. I joined in 1986. So, my mum had to leave the public service or private employment when she got married and then when she had me. So I sort of had those thoughts that it um, wasn't going to be a really long career. But but when I started um, the role, I absolutely loved what I was doing. So in terms of thinking about career, though, I never had a long-term plan. I never plan out five years, as the literature used to tell you to do. What I did was I started to realise how much I enjoyed leading people and guiding them. Uh, so I, um, there's a couple of things that I did. I sort of I started to think about what are the skills that I didn't have that I needed to build on. Uh, one of those was public speaking. I absolutely hated it. Um, got used to a little bit of that when you, I had to give evidence at court, but that was a fairly close setting not in, uh, and not about me or about subject matter and things like that. It was about the facts of the, the case. Uh, and so it was in a very structured way that we were taught to provide that evidence. So um, part of it for me, um, I moved myself out of my comfort zone and went and worked at the training college and did training programs uh, like the certificate four in workplace training and assessment in terms of how to structure um, uh, sessions, how to talk in front of people. Uh, I then progressed on later on to public speaking in other roles, in leadership roles, and always shock that people invite me and want to hear from me. But uh, again, trying to understand what does the audience want to hear in relation to that. That's one thing. Another, so pushing yourself into different roles. Uh, but the second thing is also listening to the advice of others. So I didn't just tie myself to one mentor. I got um, advice from a range of people across the organisation and externally. Um, it, similar to Cheryl, I think, because there was, when I joined around about uh, 15 to 20, 20% women at the most, probably not even that. It's gr it's gradually grown up to about 30 to 40%, but many of them are our unsworn public sector staff that work in policing organisations. So there's still around about 22, 23% women who are in sworn policing roles, generally across all police organisations in Australia. So um, I had lots of opportunities. I never felt that I was disadvantaged by being a woman because in a male-dominant organisation, I actually had more opportunity to undertake different roles, um, become a part of a learning organisation, and, and I grabbed those. So every time people give you opportunities, grab them. Um, take the advice of people if they're recommending to you to go into a different role. You may not think that it's something that you necessarily want to do or that it interests you initially, Every single role I've had, I've learned, I've grown, I've built up a different network as well uh, and different mentors and guides through that. Uh, yes, I think taking those opportunities, particularly in mid-level management roles, and, and again, Cheryl mentioned um, at each table you're at, it can be a bit daunting or you can be shouted down. I, I know often um, when I was in meetings, I would be one of the only women in, in, those, in those meetings. And uh, sometimes people at the table, I would say something, I'd, I'd offer an idea or a suggestion and people would look at me a little bit strangely. And about five or ten minutes later, a man would say the same thing. And I had at that point in a structured um, mentoring program that I was a part of, I had a really great mentor outside the organisation and I mentioned it to her and I said, how... She experienced the same thing. So I said, well, what are the strategies? How did you deal with it? So she said, there's two ways you could probably deal with it. There's probably more. But the advice she gave me was, first of all, you can um, just be happy that it's a good idea and that it's on the table. Let it, let it rest and just let people get on with the idea. The other way, if you actually you really need that credit, want to take that back, is say uh, in the meeting, I'm really glad you um you uh, said that, as I'd said five minutes ago, I agree with you, this is the way we should go, whatever whatever the issue is. So there's uh, strategies that you can get from your mentors who've had those experiences themselves. So reach out to a range of people for that advice and guidance about how they've gotten through their careers. Uh, and as I said, take also that advice about stretching yourself or listening to others who may have a better idea of what some of those areas are that you may need to expand on 
in your own career. And they can possibly see that more sometimes than you can. Thanks, Lee. And I think that's really interesting. Um, and especially you mentioned it of mentors. I think we can hopefully touch. Um, I might pass to Cheryl now um, that uh, you're back um, and hopefully you can finish a little bit about your introduction. But I'd also like to um, get your perspective on leadership. And I think, um, you know, leadership isn't management. We can all agree that management is a completely different thing. Um, but how do you develop the leadership skills? And I'm sure Army, your experience in Army would be quite unique. Um, I was listening to Julia Gillard speak on um, Q&A on Monday night and her really great insight that I sort of took away from that was developing a sense of self um, in leadership and um, that's, you know, not held hostage by anyone else. Um, so are you able to talk to um, leadership, especially your force commander over in um, a UN mission? So I'd love to hear your perspective. Look, um. I'll just I'll just follow on from that and thanks for that Kelly I'll just follow on from where I dropped out earlier which was one of the things after my first uh, sort of decade um, of my career and I had some great leadership opportunities at the junior level was really getting to understand myself and I started to believe in myself and back myself and that was very self-generated and over time and when I became a unit commander it was about that um, sense of self and that confidence and that authentic authenticity that is no one else leads like I do that's mine I don't have to try and be like someone else and be and be yourself and that's come through in spades over my career because the decisions that need to be made are not done between nine and five they're not done when everything's nice and you've had good sleep and you've um you've thought about it a lot some of the hardest decisions you make are in the middle of the night with short notice it's threat to life. There's a whole lot of issues and you have to be who you are. There is no armour. You cannot be anything else. And so developing that style is really important. And, and as I talk about growing into my skin, finding my voice, it's being true to, to, true to yourself. And that creates a vulnerability because um, I'm not like a lot of other people, but I'm really comfortable on who I am. And um, I really try to, to, to lead in that way. And I would call myself an authentic values-based um, and ethical leader. I talk about creating an inclusive and diverse work environment. That's really, really important to me. Everyone needs to have a voice. That intellectual curiosity is really, um, and that diversity of thought is really key for me. And that's really driven as, you know, a great opportunity here as a force commander. And just to frame that is, um, force, as you said, force commander of the United Nations forces uh, in Cyprus. I have um, a multinational force of 14 nations and um, I work alongside a, a policing organisation and a civilian organisation. And my responsibility is to um, de-escalate and to stop a reoccurrence of fighting between the Turkish forces and the National Guard. And for the people that I have, we have an 180 kilometre buffer zone, seven kilometres wide in some areas and, you know, a few metres in others. And um, it's quite um, it's quite difficult to lead and communicate across that um, breadth, and especially when commonality of language is not there. So by going by values base and respecting everybody, their differences in culture, their differences in gender and and allowing everybody to contribute and empowering and trusting has really come to the fore of working in a more collaborative style to pull it all together um, and, and to be able to find the best way forward. Establishing in leadership is for me also, I have to establish relationships with my Turkish Forces Commander and the National Guard Forces Commander and the key interlocutor really between both of those two individuals which um, is difficult and you know digging deep in leadership and character and when I think about what is it that makes it up is is developing your character and that is the whole of you and um, I'd say a couple of the, the key ones for me is um, in this job is really thinking about um, listening skills, uh, diversity of language and culture and how all that comes together and the taboos, the stigmas from their backgrounds and respecting those and not having and really understanding your biases, both your conscious biases and obviously we don't really understand all our unconscious biases. But as an Australian, I make so many assumptions that are not, uh, that are, that are, um, 
seemed uh, that are proved to be false in, in in this environment. So I'm very humble in my way that I I I communicate and I lead and the value that everyone um, can provide uh, to the table. So, but that has been a career's worth of growth and um, but doing it at every level it's so important to understand the people that you work with to empower and to entrust in those i'll leave it at that um but certainly i'm um, happy to take any questions on that thanks one. so much I, you touched a, a lot on, on sort of the cultural aspects of leadership i might throw to julianne now um to ask a quite specific question but um can you tell us um how dfat has changed the department's workplace culture through its women in leadership strategy and and what are your experiences sort of setting a leadership uh in culture ac across the workplace i know workplace culture is a make or break for many roles even if it's you know your dream job if the culture's not there it's not a dream job anymore. So I might pass to you to, to talk to that. Just getting my mic working. Um, yes, I'm, it, it really has been quite a significant shift. I think that we've seen uh, in DFAT since the introduction of the Women in Leadership Strategy back in, in 2015. I mean, I think really it was a, a point at which, you know, uh, we, were, we were really thinking as an organisation uh, about, you know, how and as we should do in our role, is how we project Australia to the world. Um, and of course, uh, you know, making sure that, uh, you know, how we do that reflects what our society is like in, in Australia, I think is really quite important. And, and uh, there's been a really big emphasis on, on that, um, that I, the, the capturing of diversity of thought as well is another sort of critical issue. My light has just gone off in this room. <laughs> um, well, keep talking. I think you can see me all right, can you? Yes. <laughs> um, so, yeah, the diversity of thought and capturing that as well, uh, I think all of those sorts of things have, have driven us to really look at, you know, women in leadership in the organisation. And, you know, we were getting to a stage where, you know, we had, of course, particularly when I joined around the mid-90s, you know, we had almost equal, uh, you know, graduates, sort of male, female. But when you looked at that sort of career pathway and trajectory, you know, uh, you may have done all of the same sorts of training, you know, you may have done several postings, but for some reason, you know, women were not getting to senior levels of senior executive service and, and males were. And I think, you know, it was a really important time where we sort of sat down and go and then really looked at well what was behind all of that um you know as, as cheryl mentioned it was sort of making sure that we unpacked where the unconscious bias was in the organization um it was a matter of really digging into the data so you know i mean we were very patchy before women in leadership on on collecting sex disaggregated data when it came to things like what we were doing on recruitment you know who we were sending off on postings you know what what was the you know you know the ratio of male to female heads of mission um and i think you know through women in leadership we really focused in on that a lot a lot more um making sure uh we introduced male champions of change because of course we can't make these changes unless we have the men folk involved as well <laughs> um and so, you know, I mean, our, our secretary at the time of introducing that strategy was, of course, Peter Varghese, and he really sort of took that on board as, you know, this is a critical issue for the organisation, um, you know, and making sure that the, the strategy itself was, was implemented effectively. So, um, I mean, we've now had, so we did set targets at that time um, for uh, uh, women in the senior executive service. Well, actually it was targets for men and women so we were really looking at 40% of, of senior executive positions as male, 40% uh, female, and then the extra 20% either or. Um, and I, I'm very pleased to say that in, in terms of, you know, where we have got to, uh, and we set that for 2020, we've, we've largely met a lot of those targets for both um, senior executive band one and, and senior executive band two. Uh, I think we're now over 40% of our heads of mission uh, globally um, have been women, myself included, um, you know, and I think that, that that really shows, you know, even in the space of what, that's five years, you know, there's been quite a significant uh, shift in the organisation. We've been very fortunate, of course, to have two uh, female foreign ministers in a row now. But, I mean, but they, I mean, Julie Bishop was our first, of course, in, in 2013. 
when you look across the globe, I mean, you know, um, the US only had their first Secretary of State in Madeleine Albright back in 1997, uh, where I was in Spain uh, only until, you know, uh, late last year, uh, they had their first female Foreign Minister, Ana Palacio, uh, in, in 2003. So, you know, it, it is, is um, it's, it's a, uh, an area of, of uh, interest internationally that I think, you know, not a lot of women have had roles in, senior roles, but I think that is changing. And I, you know, I certainly like to uh, ensure that, you know, I'm making a contribution to changing people's perceptions about, you know, what what is a leader? What does a female uh, leader look like, you know, in these types of positions? Thanks so much. That's so much positivity has come out of that strategy so it, I, I'm, I'm that you're seeing the results and you know it is 2020 and there's not a lot of great news happening in 2020 but that's something that you know is a shining beacon um i might um go to huang now um a bit of a different topic um you you're a trusted thought leader in your area um i, I want to know how do you develop that brand how do you become you know, an expert in your field, but then also a trusted person that people go to to seek advice about insight or analysis in, in your area. And obviously, um, Southeast Asia is, is your area of expertise um, and across a, a lot of defence and security. Um, how did you get there and, and what advice would you give to others to develop their personal brand and, and um, follow your path if they're more interested in academia as opposed to uh, departmental? Yes, um, I get a lot of these questions from uh, the interns because I manage the intern program at ASPE, but also when I was teaching at university from students uh, looking at graduate programs, looking at academic career and stuff. And I, I say uh, I'm a little bit old school and I would say there's no shortcut, it's hard work. It's, I know young people like to work smart and they should work smart, but there's also the element of hard work that you can't really escape. And this is how you build up because it's a craft, whatever you you do is a craft in there and you need to constantly train it and constantly improve for me it's the research uh, writing and presentation this these for example public speaking those are craft that I also keep uh, improving and keep learning along the way so uh, it's never like um, the, the joke we used to have at the graduate school is like okay you graduate game over but start from the bottom so it's it's never ending it's it's a lifelong process really um, uh, and in, in terms of how you build up I think um, it, it, by practicing, by learning, but also being uh, knowing that your reputation uh, is your biggest currency. Your, your reputation is the most important thing. So you have to build up. Never do uh, anything, you know, uh, too rush. Uh, don't do without. Don't publish without fact check the, checking and and stuff like that. Or. Um, the reason why I wanted to be start with in academia because I wanted to stay independent, independent in my voice, independent in my analysis, um, and and uh, you know, given given the background of experiencing the the very whirlwind and turmoil political systems and their rapid changes and collapse in some cases, I thought academia would be something that really will uh, guarantee me that kind of independence and stability in terms of, you know, not have to really de depending on the government. So, um, it, and also uh, academia gives a broad uh, options. It, you can still go to government anyway, or you be in fringes like in think tanks, like that. So, um, so in in any case, if you're doing anything and and, and uh, sign with your name, do it with you know full wholehearted. That's what I say to to the younger people. Uh, it, don't, either don't do it at all, do it with uh, in, do it and mean it uh, wholeheartedly. So uh, this has been uh, the principles that have been guiding me. Thanks so much. Um, I 100% I, I think that's applicable across whether you're in academia or anywhere um, and if you're putting your name against something you want to put your best foot forward. I might um, jump to some of the questions now. We have so many so hopefully we can um, get through a lot um, and if there's any in the panel that you've seen that you particularly want to answer please um, let's uh, go for it. But I might go for the first uh, one with the most upvotes. So um, Rebecca has asked um, thank you for joining the panel today. If you would be starting off your career now in the post-COVID world after graduating, 
what would your career progression steps, what would they be? Um, would you jump into a government position, go for a master's um, or join an organisation? Um, you know, where would you start? Um, I might throw to Leanne, um, if that's all right. <laughs> it's a tough one. It is. Um, as I said, I've been lucky to have jumped out of the public sector and now working at Aspie in a think tank. I'm actually going to touch on my daughter in a moment, but the um, most challenging bit for me has that has been um, being able to have a voice. And so Wong is um, very experienced at being able to, to do that and, you know, um, through her academic research and, and that independence. So um, that's what I'm certainly learning. Uh, how I got to Aspie, though, was by building the network and uh, the reputation as well that Wong just talked about has also really helped to, um, in, in the environment in Canberra, people knew of me, um, I'd built the network, I'd been out there speaking to people. But in terms of the actual question, so my daughter is 24. She went to university and studied international relations and commerce, so very similar to some of our um, presenters today. And she um, had that choice and was looking at graduate programs. I'm really pleased that she's working at KPMG and she's actually um, conflict of interest declared here. She is working at Defence um, on a secondment um, or a placement, however they term it, from KPMG supporting some of the um, Defence programs of work there. And uh, I'm, I think at this point in time with everything that's going on, uh, and the, the politics of things and whatever's happening. I think the public, the private sector is giving her a lot of options uh, and it's a different world. You don't have to stay in the one organisation, one career necessarily, like I certainly did for most of my life. But, I'm, you know, there is a big world out there and so don't think about limiting your opportunities. They're very vast. Public service is an amazing career also, uh, Whatever you do, you're, you're building your knowledge, you're building your experience, your expertise, your network and your reputation, again, as Fong said. So um, always be conscious of how you're projecting yourself, what you say, what you do, because that reputation goes pretty far and wide. Uh, and if it's a strong, positive one, then opportunities do come your way. Um, and often when you least expect it or least planning for it. much I think it, it is really daunting to sort of say see the world at the moment and have to make those choices so I think um, you're 100% right and looking at the trajectory of people's careers these days it's it's not necessarily one career you have many careers um, in different areas so I think that um, spoke also to Tanya's question a little bit as well um, the next question from Jasmine is is as sort of a, at the graduate level so quite early on in your career um, how would you put yourself at the, the front of the pack? Um, I don't understand how um, there are so many competent people out there and how I can be the one that gets the position when there's so few opportunities of what it seems like. Um, so I might throw, um, Julianne, uh, to you to answer this one. What, what would you like to see if you're um, hiring a graduate or, at, you know, early to mid-career? Thanks. Um, I, I really would like to see... A curious mind uh, so obviously people who are willing to you know take as much as they possibly can out of the the, the, the opportunities that have been presented to them seek out a, a variety of opportunities very early on in your career uh, you know it, it is the way the way that you uh, learn is is not only by you know the, the really positive things you do, but also the mistakes that you make. So, you know it's good it's good to uh, you know try try particularly when you're early in your career, you're still trying to find you know your way and who you are. I think it's always really important just to try as you know many many things, and and through that process. You know, you, there there is a process of it's sort of self discovery. I mean, you will work out, you know, where your strengths really do lie. So, um, you know, graduates who come into my areas and you know they're willing to try absolutely anything. I mean, they're the ones that you know you, you really you treasure, um, you know, and try and support as as much as you can. I mean, obviously, when you're a graduate, you know, trying to establish yourself a network. Uh, you know, amongst your peers, but also, uh, you know, across other areas of, of the government is also really, really useful. Um, finding yourself, uh, explore that idea that, you know, yes, you could have mentors in different 
different areas um, as well. I think that that's something really important as well. And they may not be people from your organisation. You may, may see a person outside your organisation who you think is a fantastic leader. Um, you know, go and seek those people out and, and try and learn as much as you can uh, from them. Just touching on that, um, a bit more on, I know we have a question from, from Deb about how do you connect with suitable people? Um, Julianne or anyone else on the panel, how, how would you go about finding the right mentor for you? Uh, what do you look for in a mentor and how do you approach people? Uh, it's, it can be quite an awkward question. Um, so if Julianne or anyone else has um, an answer to that, I'd love to hear. Yeah, I mean, some of it for me personally has happened quite organically. It may have been someone that I've come into contact with through the work that I've been doing and I've observed something about, as I said, their style of leadership or how they go about resolving issues that I liked. Uh, and as a result of that, I've kind of pursued a relationship with those people, um, you know, to see how I could, could learn uh, from them. Uh, I mean, there is always, a, you know, many organisations have a, a formal mentoring thing, but I, I really did, um, I guess, uh, opt for the more natural, because it really is, I mean, it's quite a personal thing, you know, trying to identify in yourself where you think you want to learn something new, um, you know, and those issues around, uh, I know for a lot of young women, sort of confidence questions and, and you know, who are the kind of role models that you see who may feel exactly the same as you, but somehow manage to kind of project uh, well in, you know, on, on an international stage. I think that, that, that for me was really quite um, important and, and looking at how they, how they manage was really, you know, something that I, I drew out of the experience. Thanks so much. Um, I also would love to take that advice. Um, I think everyone here can, can pull something out of that. Um, I might um, go to Cheryl. There's a question here from Joe. Um, how did you find that voice to speak up um, when you were speaking earlier in your intro introduction about finding your voice? Um, and I think many people, um, you know, struggle to figure out how to speak up and how what to say when they do speak up. So how did you develop that? And um, I might also... Um, add on to that Nick's question as well. Um, so how do you present yourself in the professional environment as a strong woman um, without being labelled as, um, what they've said, uh, witchy because you aren't a pushover? I think that kind of ties in to speaking up and not being a pushover and having your voice heard. So if you could speak to that, that would be great. Look, um, no, thanks for that, Kelly. Uh, I sort of speak and I had um, was very fortunate and uh, the privilege to be the commandant at our Australian Defence Force Academy. So I had a lot of young young adults that uh, worked there and I really had this sort of a mantra about getting their voice and that is being yourself, backing yourself, knowing yourself and looking after yourself. And in that, that then by knowing yourself and understanding and linking to mentors to know the things that you are not your strengths and you want to develop, um, it's really important to understand that and, and to seek out those that you see, as Julianne said, some really um, great ways that they respond in different environments or the way they lead is to seek that out. Um, but the voice is really about believing in yourself and, um, and then backing yourself. And that's important. People have you've got because they believed in you. And we have our inner critic and our inner champion. And we all have these rumbles in our head about, oh, we're not good enough, we can't do that, how am I going to say, people think I'm stupid. All these type of little internal dialogues we have and we exhaust ourselves with this dialogue. And it's actually getting that inner champion and allowing that to take the forefront and saying your inner critic out loud. And when you say that story out loud, um, it's actually, ooh, you, you question yourself. And so it's really having... Um, it's really going the inner champion of believing in yourself and then backing yourself to say it. Um, I It took a lot of courage for me and I'm still not as courageous as I'd like to be in that bra being brave. Sometimes I get daunted by my audiences. A lot of the times what I do, if it's at committee meetings or if it's significant meetings, I do what I call the shape and influence um, beforehand. I understand what everyone's, I do my homework, I work really hard of what the position is. I understand if there's any um, positions that are uh, alternate to mine, who are my challenges gonna be? And I had a wonderful executive coach 
who told me about those who sniped and the, the grenade throwers and all these different styles of generally males in the room that will try to unhinge you. And so understanding the audience, understanding your topic and being very um, confident in the depth of it that you can get past the first question. If you're very shallow in your understanding of a topic, you have a vulnerability that as soon as they ask the next question and you'll back off. But if it's an area and you're confident, is to go forth and say yeah, success comes off the back mm -hmm. of failures. So you really got to give it a shot every time. Um, I think Leanne had a comment yeah, as well. And yeah. I'll just I'll just add a couple of things to what Cheryl was saying. The other thing is just don't be afraid to make yourself look silly. There's no such thing as a silly question. Uh, and asking it in the form of a question, I think in a meeting setting and other things, helps you avoid that you're being a witch, you're just telling people what to think or whatever. Um, it's it's how you phrase it, um, being curious. And then if you think something's fallen flat within a meeting environment, again, go to someone you trust after the meeting and just say, what was my reading in that room? I didn't quite understand it. So that curiosity, asking questions always is the best strategy, particularly if you're feeling a little bit less um, confident or a, a bit nervous about speaking up. Thanks so much. Um, I I think that's a uh, great lessons to learn, and it's it's important to know that we should always want to speak up. And um, I think um, I might go to Nicole's question next. Um, Nicole um, says, uh, "I work in a male dominated field, and often find myself the only woman at the table, and often raise points like moving to gender inclusive language in our communications." and um, she finds colleagues often see this as bureaucracy at work. So how do you c combat those opinions and champion inclusive approaches? Um, I'd love if ev everyone could touch on this because I think that everyone's working in such different fields. Um, everyone would have a voice to this, but I, I might Im immediately throw um, to Huang and then Julianne because I think um, I'd love to hear both of your perspectives on this. Yeah, well, luckily uh, it is expanding. You in the, this couple of years I've been here in Canberra, I think it is important that we have uh, the conversation going. I think there was a quite um, a momentum, for example, um, in how in, in, in our field, Think Tank and Academia, when we were um, rejecting the panels, all male panels, or um, if, uh, if you know, the the me meetings where there are only men, uh, especially in terms of national security uh, agenda. And unfortunately, since the COVID, I think there are anecdotal uh, research showing that um, less and uh, less women are uh, submitting uh, publications and again, more and more panels re-emerging because just because working from home uh, uh, conditions are, are uh, uh, also not in, in conducive enough uh, for a lot of women. I've raised that uh, a number of times, for example, no um, all men uh, webinars. And um, it's not always well received. There's a, there's a lot of uh, pushback sometimes, uh, but it is important that we keep the conversation going and, and things like that. Uh, like this meeting, it's, it's very good because it builds up a little bit um, our own energy and, and inspires a little bit and uh, keeps us going. So from time to time, I think uh, we just have to remind uh, ourselves and then pick up each other and, and go forward. Uh, you know, it's never going to be comfortable uh, and, and it, it, well, it's not going to be comfortable uh, as long as it is not done right. So um, we just have to get used to that. And that if someone is not comfortable uh, with that, then this is their problem. They need to get comfortable with this. Absolutely. Um, Julianne, I, as a ambassador for gender equality, I'd love to be effective on this as well. Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting to to really think on on this question of you know um, who you're communicating to. Um, you know, uh, even if you're working in a very male dominated area, the likelihood is that uh, you know the people that you need to communicate with outside of that work area are in fact you know a mix of men and women. Uh, you know, even in, in the security sphere, I think, you know, we, we have seen as studies that have proven, you know, in conflict areas where you involve women uh, in conflict resolution and, uh, you know, and peace agreement negotiation, you have far better outcomes 
if women are involved. So, you know, I would always, uh, in, I guess, encourage people to kind of think about, you know, well, what, you know, who, it's not, it's not just, we're not trying to communicate to ourselves. There is a broader audience out there that we are trying to register messages with. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's really important that, that there is that more inclusive uh, language that, that is used because that's the only way you can really resonate with the people you'd actually need to communicate with. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I'm going to try and get through some. We have so many questions and five minutes left. Um, I've got a question from Caitlin. Um, what education courses, uni or short courses, really set you up for different roles? And for Cheryl, um, what advice would you have for young defence officers in regards to postings in order to get the more diplomatic overseas postings later in your career? And I, I know, Cheryl, that um, you've had... Uh, well, you've graduated from many like staff college and two master's degrees. I'd love to get your uh, perspective on that. Look, I um, I had a longer term goal that I, you know, and it's a bit like that continual wanting to learn, um, learning for life um, sort of saying. And uh, I joined straight from school. Females weren't allowed to um, get an education as part of defence when I joined. So it was something that I did when I was in the military and I spent um, – part-time and full-time time getting um, um, improving my education and improving my uh, my intellectual knowledge in, in areas that interest me and also interested defense and so for me and getting jobs overseas really has just I'll go back to doing each job you do well and uh, doing the best you can do and registering your interests for consideration doing us uh, what I would call a follow-up to go is there opportunities um, and for me, East Timor um, was a great opportunity that my bosses saw. I didn't see that in myself and they provided the opportunity for me for East Timor. And that was hard. I had two young daughters at that time and I didn't know that I could do that. And and then uh, for me, Afghanistan, um, Australian forces in Afghanistan, I honestly, I had laid fairly low as my two daughters were going through high school. Um, it, I wasn't prepared to be away from them for 12 months during that period. When my youngest went to university, it was a time and I said, this is my time now and I wanted an opportunity um, to deploy and did that. So it has been a mix. It's doing doing every job you do in your career, whatever it may be, to the best of your ability. And, um, and then those who do the selections, dem you're demonstrating your potential and everything's about potential, not just performance. And so it is um, that continual growing, that continual learning and then those opportunities um, will present and for my force commander here I needed to have previous UN experience and my my job as a young major um, going to East Timor set me up for this opportunity which is a real privilege to have now so um, yeah it's it's a mix it's a mix of having some really good ad, not advocates but really good um, people thinking about it um, understanding when you can when you don't wish to serve and you're trying to priorities and getting that balance right, but then um, really supporting you and on performance alone, going hard. Thanks so much. I'm going to ask one last question. Unfortunately, there's so many great ones here. Um, what we can do is if the panelists have time when we conclude the webinar, you can go through and type answers. So I encourage everyone to spend five to 10 minutes just um, answering what we can. Um, but I might touch on this last one and ask everyone to, to answer. Um, Renee has asked, what's the best advice you can give to help plan a career? And I'd love to know your perspectives on, have you planned your career? If not, how did it come about and, and what would you recommend? Um, Leanne, I might start with you and, and we can work our way around. Sure, so I mentioned earlier, I haven't planned, hadn't planned my career. I never ever would have thought I'd get to a three-star equivalent or deputy commissioner of the federal police, not in a million years. Um, so I think take every opportunity that comes to you in terms of qualifications and touching on that last question, um, it doesn't really matter if, if um, whatever you do in terms of studies, you, if you're passionate about it, um, the best um, thing is to, to go with that sort of a qualification or area of study or area of work because um, you'll learn the most, you'll, you'll be really committed to it. Uh, qualifications give you great research, writing, um, analytical, conceptual skills. So that's what people would be looking for. Um, no matter what the actual degree is necessarily, unless it's a speciality like a forensics degree that you need to have forensic science. Um, but, yeah, be passionate, be curious, 
um, be enthusiastic and, and think about the way you're portraying yourself because it does go to your whole reputation um, through your career and and you've got the world before you. So just take every opportunity that comes your way. Thanks. I might pass to Huang if you're able to talk to the girl. Um, it is important to know what is ahead, what kind of path you want to take. For example, if it's academic, um, know what are the steps there. For example, if you go for um, an American style of graduate school, it will take you much longer than Australian or, um, or European. And that matters because, for example, by the time you get the PhD in American system, which was my case, um, is 10 years and it is there therefore you know people who go into a graduate program without that knowledge um often end up dropping out and actually this system has you know is 80 70 to 80 percent of dropout so know where you want to go talk to people um that had been ahead got went through and know what you want to head towards in terms of planning i wasn't ever very good in you know very uh uh, detailed planning in terms of career because I did know that I want to work internationally and, and that's what I'm doing. I did know that I want to work in uh, academia think tank and with policy relevant um, uh, uh, work. Uh, so it is broadly, but um, there's no way I could plan in five years I will be at ASPI or, or something like that. There are opportunities that will come up. Uh, and if it's academia in particular, it's very narrow, very specific um, field. Every one of us gets trained for years, you know, up to 10 years or even more to be very uh, specialized, to be an expert in a very specialized field. So um, to have, have that in mind, if you really, if, uh, you know, graduate, uh, schools and, and academic careers is in in in, um, uh, in your planning, but to understand that that pathway and know what it takes to get there is a lot of sacrifices along the way. It's a lot of hard work, but you know if it's like everyone else in the panel said, if it's your passion and and then it's worth that sacrifice and hard work. Thanks so much, um, Julianne. If you can uh, speak to that one. Um, I don't think I had a, a real vision, a longer term vision for what my career path would be. But I do think, yeah, knowing what it is that, that really drives you, what you enjoy, uh, certainly does help. As I said, I had a, you know, I mean, the terminology these days is a career anchor. I guess if my had a career anchor, it would really be sort of the international trade negotiating sort of sphere. Um, but I did that because I, I enjoyed the work and I think that does help with your motivation levels, you know, over a longer longer term if, if you find something that you really enjoy. That said, I do think it is really important that you extend yourself to other things over time, which is why, yes, you know, I've been happy to kind of venture off to, to Spain, who wouldn't, <laughs> um, uh, you know, to, to, to try the, the role of ambassador there and, and certainly, you know, this, this current role that I have as the uh, ambassador for gender equality, you know, brings a whole range of new issues and, and, and new, new challenges for me, uh, you know, in the role itself. So um, find a, an, an anchor, something that really motivates you, but, but don't get too comfortable either. Make sure you, you know, you always look for opportunities to extend yourself. So much, you know, I'll throw to Cheryl if you're able to um, answer the same, same thing. Look, um, I agree with everything that's been said. My only probably, Kelly, my only other thought is is um, to keep it broad, um, to have a general goal, but extend yourself, as Julianne said, to go to areas that you don't think that um, are within the broader goal but not the ideal job because sometimes the ideal job really lets you down. Um, it, for me, my growth has come from areas that have not been generally the mainstream and it's been the people I've worked with and if I said one one thing if you can find a work environment that has the right people that really empower you and 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 help build your confidence to pursue um, knowledge to pursue opportunities they are the ones that will really help you go and the other one is too for me is very much um, you know when your time to change job is very much when you can no longer feel you can value add and um, you don't, your purpose, you're questioning your purpose of what you're doing and why you're doing it. 
And that to me is generally the triggers for then looking for the next opportunity. And don't try and get there too quick. You know, um, if you choose to take a path, if you choose to go aside, you know, um, for all of my colleagues here and the audience there, our careers um, have done a bit of meander, have done have great opportunities in themselves and life's too short to um, to be jumping, wanting to be um, at the top by the time you're 40. What are you going to do between 40 and 80? So really um, expand and broaden so that, um, you know, you, you can have choice later. Thank you so much. Um, I think we're going to have to wrap it up there. If I can encourage all of our panellists to take a few minutes and answer some of the questions, that would be great. Um, and thank you so much to everyone for joining us. Um, before we go, I'd just like to give a quick plug to our conference we have coming up. Aspie's hosting a virtual uh, conference over the course of four weeks. Stan Grant's going to be in conversation with uh, Min the Minister for Defence, Cement the Power. We have a great lineup. So check out the events page on the Aspie site if you'd like to sign up. And a huge thank you to our panelists tonight. Really appreciate your time, especially after hours. But as Hong said, it's a lifestyle sometimes. Um, and we'll try and pull together another panel shortly. Um, it seems like there's, there's a real demand for them, especially with the world so uncertain. So I'll leave it there and, and thank you so much. <laughs>